I would venture to say in the house right now, some of you are dealing with petty paninas in your life. We're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to stay the course, but there's one or two folks standing in between you and jail time. But the text, the, te the text is going to help you. Welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. We do not believe that there are mistakes or any coincidences, but that God has ordained that you be here with us today. And it is our hope that you are truly blessed by our time of worship together. Welcome and God bless you. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge a very special guest that we have with us today in the person of the Reverend Dr. Gwendolyn E. Boyd, the 22nd National President of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. This is today when I'm so proud to be a Delta. <laughs> Dr. Boyd is an engineer by training and former president of Alabama State University. And she is an ordained preacher and teacher at Ebenezer AME Church, Fort Washington, Maryland. Dr. Boyd, we are honored by your presence and I'm gonna, pastor's not here, so I'm gonna invite all of the sorors of Delta Sigma Theta sorority to stand so that we can let you know how much we love you. Dr. Boyd is here this morning to support our preacher for the morning. who just happens to be the newly elected co-chair of the Social Action Committee for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She is our own minister, Siobhan Arline Bradley. Many of you know her to be a powerful and spirit-filled and authentic preacher. But the thing that I love about Minister Bradley is that in addition to being a powerful and spirit-filled and authentic preacher, she is a powerful and spirit-filled and authentic person. Yes. If you spend five minutes with her, you know that she loves the Lord. And because she loves the Lord, she's going to find a way to love you. And I thank God for her. And we are... We are prayerfully looking forward to the word that she's going to bring to us this morning. God bless you, Minister Bradley. Praise the Lord, everybody. Blessings are running over and over and over. I started thinking about my blessings that are running over and over and over. Oh, and I'm so grateful for the blessings. I'm so grateful for the blessing of life, the blessing of breath, the blessing of sound mind, over. You don't know what I've been through this week. The blessings are running over. And I don't mind crying because I know these tears are joy. To my pastor, who's had to whisk away on a plane, I thank him for the opportunity to stand behind the desk. I thought he was joking about Al Sharpton until I saw him. It's like, wouldn't it take me off the list? <laughs> but I'm so grateful to be here. To Reverend Judy, who's a force, I thank you. To the love of my life who's here, my husband, Andrew Bradley, I thank you. And to the nursery downstairs, I thank God for the nursery. Ha! Ha! You don't know about three-year-olds in church. They, 
they'll drive you to drink, but I thank God for the people that sacrifice their time in sanctuary to take care of our... Miss D, I love you. I got, a, I got something for you, Miss D. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> to my family and sorrows that are here, I love you. I thank you. And to Sarah Boyd, grateful. I have one mother who birthed me and has taken care of me for all 39 of my years, but God sent me other moms in the sorority and she is one of them so I thank you I thank you there is a word from the Lord first Samuel chapter 1 the text is from 1 to 20 but I'm going to skip around a little bit to give you context if you will stand with me I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version first Samuel chapter 1 the text is from 1 to 20, but I'm going to start at verse 2. If you have it, say amen. amen. He, meaning Elkanah, had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Panina. Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man, Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Panina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she, meaning Panina, used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Come down to verse nine. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorstep of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly. Come down to 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord. I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Come down to 17. And Eli said, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, and for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of God. And just for a few moments, I want to preach from the subject the impossible possible. The impossible possible. Society is infatuated with the impossible. If you take a peek down the American history road, you'll find countless obstacles overcome that were once thought to be impossible. When millions of men, women, and children came to this country from the continent of Africa and fathoming their freedom just couldn't be possible. But it happened. The thought of ancestors of those same slaves attending a college and becoming professional when this country put in writing that they were actually three-fifths of a person, many thought that's impossible. But then there came Cheney, and then there came Howard, and then there came Hampton, and then there came Virginia Union. It happened. When the Wright brothers decided they wanted to build a plane, folks were on the sidelines saying, people in machines that can fly, 
That's impossible. Yeah, but it happened. Neil Armstrong will be the first American man to walk on the moon, and even with the super bad hidden figures. Inside that same room, folks said, that's impossible. <laughs> but it happened. My shero, Wilma Rudolph, saw raw <laughs> Rudolph, was born with polio and could only walk with the use of braces on her legs. And she told the doctors, but I want to be an Olympic champion. And the doctor said, honey, that's impossible. But in 1960, it happened. <laughs> when Barack Hussein Obama, decided to run as a black man in 08 for the president of these United States. Many of us in this room said, come on, Barack, not in this lifetime. That's impossible, but it happened. And the thought of Donald Trump becoming the president of these United States over a former secretary of state. Many of us thought that's impossible, but it happened. And even in the church, the thought of a woman standing behind a sacred desk to preach the gospel of Jesus. Men, women, children, black and white said that's impossible. But that happened. For, for many of us, impossibility stands as the great wall between you and your destiny. These obstacles we face can cause us to lose sight of God's promise for your life because you don't have the faith to see possible in the impossible. And even the most spiritual, tongue-talking, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost folk. Gotta be honest about some stuff. Life will cause your faith to falter. No matter who you are, where you come from, your degrees, your position, if you are a baby in Christ, if you are a seasoned saint, you are not exempt from impossible situations. Now let's get real. You know that feeling when you have a desire in your heart, you're longing for God to move on something in your life, and what happens? Nothing. There's no movement. There's no progression. Just silence. And then you get to the point where you decide, maybe this promise over my life was a figment of my imagination. That's where we find my girl Hannah in the text, facing the impossible. Although her husband loved her and even favored her, she could not receive it because of her circumstances. Living as a barren woman was almost an unbearable fact of life. But to make matters worse, Hannah was a bystander of her society. Her husband had another wife with whom he would consummate his marriage with and to throw salt in the womb that other wife could have multiple offspring. Put yourself in Hannah's shoes. You and your husband, living with him and his other wife, and their children, and you're heckled daily by this heifer in your house. I don't know about you, but that sounds impossible. to deal with. In, in, in life, you'll be faced with the impossible situation and even insurmountable odds that will stretch you beyond your perceived faith capacity. In those times, church, you gotta remember that your relationship with God, a persistent faith, and his promise for your life can overcome any obstacle that confronts you and will lead you to your life's purpose and destiny. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna jump in this thing. I got a question that I think the text can help us answer. What can you expect when facing life's impossible situations? Well, first church, you can expect your enemies to augment the severity of your situation. Come on to verse six. 
Her rival used to provoke her, provoke her severely, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. And as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Panina used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah was troubled because she was actually in an unfair fight. She was battling two different enemies. The, the, the first enemy was the very present Nemes, who just so happened to live in her house. Everywhere Hannah went, there was Petty Panina right there. And notice in the text that Hannah couldn't even go to church without seeing her enemy and face all the things that would vex her emotionally. I would venture to say in the house right now, some of you are dealing with petty paninas in your life. We're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to stay the course, but there's one or two folks standing in between you and jail time. But the text, the, te the text is going to help you. It's going to help you understand that you will face petty paninas of the world because your enemies are placed in your life to position your focus on your failure and not your focus on the Heavenly Father. I, I know that's, that's good. That's good. That's good. Because I, I needed that for me. He, he, he lets folk come in your life to mess with you. To focus on how you failed instead on the Father. Now, your enemies will rise up and speak against your very existence. They will intentionally augment those vulnerable places in your life. You don't deserve that title. You shouldn't have that promotion. You haven't done this before. You're not really that qualified. Matter of fact, you're actually not what we're looking for. And that's actually cold word for your melanin and your ministry too much for me. Petty. Petty. Don't miss this, church. The enemy is committed to using whatever it takes to steer you away from the path God has placed you on. But I realized something, that as soon as people begin to tell me what I can and cannot do, as soon as people begin to say who I am and who I am not, I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm actually at that point in position to see what God has for me. Don't miss your shout this morning. Every naysayer, every hater, every racist, every person that abused me, every person that used me, got a petty panina assignment in your life. And the only way, church, to answer pettiness is with persistence, per persistent faith and persistent dreams and persistent vision and persistent fasting and persistent praise and persistent worship, persistent dreams and persistent fasting, persistent prayer, persistent worship, persistent dreams, persistent fasting, persistent prayer, persistent worship. How do you think our ancestors got through Jim Crow? How do you think they got through Paul Connor and the white citizens count? Persistent prayer, persistent faith, persistent... think we're going to get through this mess right now 45 David Duke quiet evangelical pastors persistent faith persistent prayer persistent faith, persistent worship. the only way to answer pettiness is with persistence The only way, I, I, I was in the fifth grade at Forest Hill Elementary School in Camden, New Jersey, and I had a homegirl named AJ, and AJ and I were best of buddies, and then fifth grade happened, and she mounted up a coup against me in class. <laughs> AJ was mad because I was cool. I was cool in fifth grade. I had, I had friends, I had a rep, I had a crew. <laughs> so there was one particular day that I, that girl just heckled me. And I wasn't really a fight, okay. I wasn't that much of a fighter <laughs> in school. But that joker heckled me every single day. And there was one day she came for me. And I decided at that moment, I'm gonna stand toe to toe with this 10 year old Panina. 
And I realized in that moment that I had what it took to stand right face to face with my enemies. Life's gonna come at you like a fifth grade bully. You're gonna be prodded, you're gonna be pushed, and it'll even make you believe that the God in you doesn't even give you enough power to live. But child of God, you stand in the face of your hecklers. You look at them right in the face. I see you, Petty P. I see you, Petty P. There's no weapon formed against me that shall prosper. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not, not your racism, not your hate, not your criticism, not your dysfunction. No, 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 no. Hannah's first battle was with that Panina. But the second battle was with herself. I'm still in the text. She was preoccupied with her circumstance and the torment of her enemy, and it robbed her of her own nourishment to live. She kept crying and not eating. And this is a vicious cycle we find in the body of Christ. And if you're not careful, the words of the enemy that speak against you will take control over you because of the dialogue inside of you. I'm going to say that again. Yeah, it's tweetable. That's good. That's good. If you're not careful, the words of your enemies that speak against you can actually take over you because of the dialogue inside of you. Maybe I'm not qualified, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I'm not effective, maybe I'm not a good parent, maybe I'm not a good spouse, maybe I'm not a good church member. I bind that mess in the name of Jesus. You are already fighting an enemy that you can't control. Stop fighting an enemy that you can control. Life's gonna back you up. There'll be disease, there'll be discourse, there'll be depression, and there might even be some doubt. But when you start doubting, just start thinking about the source of your strength. Just start thinking about who has met your needs and think about the one you've committed your life to serve. Your enemies will augment the severity of your situation. Not only will they do that, but when you're facing life's impossible situations, you must expect others to misunderstand persistent praise and persistent prayer. Come to nine, after they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now, Eli the priest, was sitting on the side before the doorpost of the temple. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Come down to 13. Hannah prayed silently and her lips moved, but her voice was not heard and Eli thought she was drunk. Hannah is vexed at this moment in the text because for years she's been tormented and she's lived a life with a host of unanswered prayers. She did her religious duty. She went to the temple. She prayed to God. She taught Sunday school. She tithed her first fruits. She did the beautification project. But still no baby and no relief from her nemesis. Hannah at this point is so desperate that she literally positioned herself in the only place she knew that God would meet her. Now let me stop you right here. When you're facing the impossible and decide you're going to trust the will of the Lord, even when it don't look like it's going to turn out the way you want it to, there's going to be folk that are going to say, you are crazy. You mean you still going to Alpha Street praising God and he hasn't even blessed you yet? You mean you still pray to a God that hasn't answered your prayers? You mean you praise a God that hasn't relieved you from your pain? I stopped by to help you, church. Don't let fools interfere with your faith. You see, you can't let opinions hinder your praying. And you can't let pessimism stop your praise. You know where God's brought you from. You know what God has delivered you from. You know who and what God protected you from. Now, many of you are thinking this. I expect that in the world. But what about when it's the church folk? The church leaders, Eli the priest, he was sitting there at the doorpost of the temple and immediately jumped to the conclusion that Hannah was drunk. Now, I, I did some studying and I found this. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22, you find out that Eli was actually not pleased with his own sons who were priests too. 
because there were sexual encounters between his sons and women at the door of the tabernacle. Now, many theologians are suggesting that Eli might have assumed that Hannah was one of the women at the door of the tabernacle. And when all the while she was doing was getting in position to ask for her request to be made known to God. Now, now, see this text. Hannah was in a position of prayer. She wasn't falling over. She wasn't at a bar. She wasn't at a brothel. So how is it that the church leader, the anointed priest, ordained so-and-so could misunderstand a heartfelt prayer for drunkenness? Now let me cut to the chase, because I take issue with Eli in this text. (laughs) Brother Eli, why were you at that same doorpost watching if you were so concerned about the lewd acts that your children were doing. Why, Brother Eli, weren't you leveraging your position with God to help empower and encourage a mourning sister? Why, Brother Eli, weren't you welcoming Hannah in the church house instead of sitting on the sidelines judging outside the church house? Why, Brother Eli, did you immediately jump to conclusions about her drunkenness instead of jumping into position and in the presence of God over her situation? Why, Eli, when Hannah was crying out to the Lord, were you not equipped to recognize that the woman of God needed the man of God to hear a word from God? And I'm going to tell you right now, church, I got issues with Eli, but I also got issues with the church, because I suggest to you that even in 2017, the church is showing some Eli tendencies. Uh, Eli, I got to take issue with the church when we can sit on a sideline, watch hatred on television, and decide that all we can do is just pray instead of posturing our power to pray and protest. Why, why, church? When our young girls and our young boys are being trafficked as sex objects for the pleasure of perverts and money, that we would blame the child's home life instead of going in there to save their life. I take issue, church, when someone has an encounter with the Holy Ghost and you don't like the way they do it, that you question their authenticity in worship. We got work to do, church. There are some common mishaps in the body of Christ. You see, we try to put a box around people in a church instead of encouraging them all the way to their breakthrough. But no, no, instead we resort to our pious arrogance and judgment and consequently stand in the way of them getting their blessing. But church, let me tell you something. When the church misunderstands you, you might find yourself concerned about what they think about you. Now let me help you, Alpha Street. Take a lesson from the text here. When you are at the point of no return, don't let anybody or anything that misunderstands your worship get in the way to block your breakthrough. Desperate situations will cause you to run down the aisle to the altar. Desperate situations will make you cry a little louder. Desperate situations will make you fall out on your face before the Lord. And sometimes desperation will make you put your hands up and shut your mouth. Whatever your response is, in the midst of that circumstance, don't let anybody or anything stand in the way. Don't worry about what they say. Just pray for the impossible. Don't worry about what they say. Lay hands on your long shots. Don't worry about what they say. Jump in your spirit for the joy you're looking for in your life. Don't worry about what they say. Just be silent before God and hear his voice. And don't worry about what they say. Get out in them streets and march for Jesus and justice. I got to get out of here. Not only can you expect your enemies to augment the severity of your situation, and not only can you expect people to misunderstand your persistent prayer and your persistent praise, but finally, when you're facing life's impossible situations, you can expect God to answer impossible requests. It's in the text. Verse 17 says, Eli answered, go in peace, 
The God of Israel grant the petition you made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters. She ate and drank with her husband. And her countenance was sad no longer. Look at the text. In verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then it says they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife. He knew her very well because the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Hannah had prayed years upon years to give birth to a child, but she was barren. Listen, because the Lord closed her womb. And I missed it the first few times because actually uh, you could think that it was a condition that she had. She was just a barren woman, but no, the text says it was at the command of the Lord that her womb was closed. Now don't miss this. Hannah's impossible circumstance actually laid in submission to the only one capable of making it possible. You don't, all right, come, come on, come on, come on. The thing that she longed for was in the hands of the only one that could grant it to her. That's a word for us today. I would suggest to you that there's evidence in the text that persistence and preparation will garner a shift in your outcome. You see, she went to the tabernacle. She connected, hooked up with Eli, and after being misunderstood, she even pressed her way then. Now in those days, the priests, they were associated with discerning the will of God. So once she got a glimpse of her promise, once she understood that her impossible situation just might be possible now, she changed her countenance. And don't misunderstand the message this morning. Sometimes God's got to know an N-O. Sometimes his no is a no. And because of God's sovereignty, we have to accept what he allows. But then there are times when there are impossible things that show up in your life. And you've got to hold on with dear life to the promise that God has for you. Some of you right now are toe-to-toe -to -toe with your impossible. Things are looking so grim that you don't even think God is hearing your prayers. Well, i got news for you. If there's a Samuel that you've been asking for, and if you're expecting that God can answer your impossible request, then you need to start preparing for it to come to pass. Look at the text. Verse 19 to 20, Hannah didn't just leave her prayer at the tabernacle. After asking for the desire of her heart, she got up, went back home, and after emptying herself in prayer, she began to plant a seed with her husband. Don't miss that word. And in the middle of all her mess at home, despite the abuse Despite the vexing, she continued on her path toward her promise. Now, Alpha Street, this is a good word for us because many times we just leave our cares on the altar and miss the point of why we submit and surrender to the altar. Surrender doesn't mean you just solely pray and watch God. See, that you, we've learned it too churchy. Just let God do it. No, surrender does not mean to solely pray and watch God. It means you pray, you submit it, and then prepare yourself for it. I got faith in it. I took my hands off it. And now I gotta go get ready for it. For some of you, impossible might be looking for a job. Impossible might be looking for a husband or a wife. Impossible might be healing from a disease. Impossible might be a bankruptcy. But whatever it is, it's time to start preparing for your possible. I'm going to close here. I, I, I was a collegiate athlete. I, I ran track in college. And I went to school because I wanted to be Flo Jo. <laughs> for young people, like, who is Flo Jo? Get your life. The baddest girl with the longest hair. And I'm honey, I wanted nails. I was doing this. I couldn't even run that fast, but I was on the line like with nails. I wanted to be Flojo. And I had a great freshman year in college. And then my sophomore year came and I knew something was wrong. I lost an insurmountable amount of weight. I had three menstrual cycles a month and my body started shutting down. 
Now, if you know the rules of the NCAA, that's the collegiate association that runs all of the policies of collegiate athletes. If you can't play your sport, they're not entitled or required to pay your tuition. And I was anxious because I knew if I couldn't run, I'd have to come back to Jersey to go to school because we couldn't afford for me to go to Tulane University. And then it happened, I got that call from the doctor who diagnosed me with endometriosis at 19 years old. But I told him, man, I'm, you don't, I'm Flojo, you. What are you, what are you saying? <laughs> I got nails. He didn't know who I was. So then I, this is what I did. I, I, I called my parents and we prayed and I said, God, I don't, I don't know, but I know you know. And this is what I did. I kept going to practice. I couldn't participate, but I just kept going to practice. I kept going to meetings. I didn't go to class. I'd get up and put on my sneakers every single day. And then the next day, my coach called me. He said, we made a decision about your future. He said, come down to my office. So I came down, I got my parents on the phone. He said, Mr. and Mrs. Arline, I promised you that I would take care of your daughter if anything happened to her. So don't worry about running. I'm going to keep your scholarship for four years. Now, there's more to this story because, see, what you're missing is then impossible, impossible situations don't stop coming. So when I got through one big impossible to get my schooling for free, I needed to figure out what I was going to do next. And there was a graduate program at the same school at Tulane in New Orleans, Louisiana that I wanted to go to. But two things stood in my way. Tuition in the GRE. I ain't shame. I couldn't, man, that computer, I was like. <laughs> and the thing about it was I was a good student, but I wasn't a good test taker. And so you know what I did? I prayed that same prayer. And then I said, I'm going to take the GRE. I took it in the name of Jesus. I bombed it. I was praying, God, I thank you. I just, you're going to just get me. I bombed it again. <laughs> God, I, if you be the God I serve right now, then I bombed it three times. But you know what I did? I put on my clothes every morning like I was going to class. I put a book bag on my shoulder to act like I was about to go to class. And the next day I was about to call for that fourth GRE, and then my phone rang. And it was the dean of the School of Public Health. She said, I heard you've been trying to take the GRE and that you bombed it three times. I said, who told you that? <laughs> Pump your brakes, man. <laughs> who she said, listen, don't take any more tests. And I said, ma'am, the only way that I can get in is if I pass your standardized test. She said, I have the power. to override any test. And that which was impossible on that day became possible. She said, all you gotta do is get a 3.5 and I'll take you off probation. Well, I got a 3.8 and she gave me a full scholarship. So the same girl you're looking at 20 years ago left New Orleans with two degrees for free. <laughs> And matter of fact, 20 years later, I had a same little baby boy downstairs that this body used to shut down on. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning. But I tell you what, I will mount up my faith today because what is impossible is actually impossible. It is possible. I don't know about you, but I want to see my Samuel. I want to see what I've been praying for. I want to see what I've been fasting for. I want to see what I've been crying for. Manifest here on earth on this side of heaven I don't know about you but I stand ready to see the possible in the impossible I don't know about you but I'm gonna prepare like it's coming so Alpha Street get ready line up with God's call on your life I'm ready for the new building project. I'm ready for a new ministry. I'm ready for a new business. I'm ready for my health and strength. Don't you worry about what people say. 
Because when you're dealing with the impossible, you can expect folk to misunderstand you and you can expect your enemies to look at you and say, oh, your situation is so severe. But I promise you this, expect God to answer impossible requests because that which is impossible is really possible with God.